The hunt for whales. Japan has resumed commercial whaling in its waters despite global outrage. But is the practice commercially sustainable? And what are the cultural roots of whaling in Japan? And is culture a justification? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the programme. I'm Peter Dobby. Whales were hunted to the brink of extinction until 1986, when a group of countries agreed to temporarily stop whaling for profit, which turned into a semi-international ban. However, conservationists are now worried the species might be facing a similar threat. Many countries continue to hunt whales for what they say are scientific purposes. And Japan, which is one of the leading commercial whaling countries, has now resumed that practice in its waters. It says whaling is part of its culture and can be done in a sustainable way. But as Mariana Hond explains, Japanese palates and tastes have moved on. For more than 30 years, the International Whaling Commission has been locked in a fight. Its job is to protect whales pushed close to extinction. Yet three countries, Norway, Iceland and Japan, have pursued the right to hunt them. Late last year, Japan argued there was scientific proof some species had recovered enough to allow sustainable hunting. And it pushed again for the 1986 ban on commercial whaling to be lifted. When the Whaling Commission rejected Japan's proposal, Japan withdrew. Japan says it will only hunt in its territorial waters, not the open seas of the Antarctic and North Pacific, where it has, until now, been hunting for scientific research. And it's not clear whether there'll even be a market in Japan for the whale meat the ships bring to shore. Consumption in Japan has plummeted from around 200,000 tonnes each year in the 60s to just 5,000 tonnes each year over the last five. That could be due to the changing tastes of a new generation, but changing attitudes to hunting whales are likely a factor too. And things at the International Whaling Commission will be different. Japan's departure has arguably left it weakened, but after a more than three decade fight over commercial whaling, it's now free to concentrate on what it was originally formed to do. Commercial whaling is now back on the list of threats to the world's whales. But there too is a climate crisis that's already adversely impacting the oceans and marine life within them. A looming threat that could well eclipse them all. OK, let's get going. Let's bring in the panel. Joining us today from Southampton in the UK, Ken Collins, Senior Research Fellow in Ocean and Earth Sciences at the Faculty of Environmental and Life Sciences at the University of Southampton. In Tokyo, Michael Penn, President of Japan's Shingetsu News Agency. And in Bristol, also in the UK, Mark Simmons, Senior Marine Expert at the Humane Society International. Welcome to you all. Michael Penn in Tokyo. First time in 31 years, more than three decades. What's the point? Well, the point basically is to keep a political constituency happy. Uh, there are uh, some small towns along the coast in Japan where uh, the economy is, is largely based on whaling. And these small towns have political uh, politicians who, who, who represent them, uh, and they are influential politicians. So it's more a matter of the fact that there's a lobby uh, on one side of the issue in Japan, but not really on the other. And the pro-whaling side, politically, is stronger. Ken Collins, is it enough to say it's cultural? Well, potentially, yes, but uh, I, I question that there is the demand. And the one thing that avoids much attention is the fact there is a considerable uh, culling of small cetaceans which are outside such as dolphins, porpoises, which are outside of any international treaties. Mark Simmons in Bristol, does this give the government a, a longer term exit strategy because they can get away from the situation of subsidising what is, you know, when it comes to profit and loss, what is a very expensive industry to maintain? Uh, this is a very strange situation that we're now in. We've had uh, decades of argument uh, with Japan about its scientific whaling. 
and now it's turned from that to this overt form of, of commercial whaling and it's stepped outside of the IWC. And that's put it in, in a position where um, detractors can turn around and say that you're a, you're a pirate whaling nation. So this is a very awkward situation and it creates sort of poor relations or it exacerbates poor relations between Japan and, and other nations and raises issues, of course, about animal conservation and welfare. Ken, let's talk about that idea of science. What is the scientific benefit to whaling, if there is any benefit at all? I don't see any. Um, one of our problems with the marine environment today is that we have lost a lot. We are losing hand over fist our large predators. So I'm not talking just about whales, sharks, large, large fish such as the big tuna. And removing any big predators from an ecosystem is is disastrous. And so, you know, I mean, in Africa, we could re remove the elephants and the lions, uh, and that has a knock-on system for the health of the whole ecosystem. And I think the tr same is true of the oceans. You know, there is a role for large, the large predators within the system, and we do not need the whale meat, uh, and Japan certainly doesn't, and I doubt if this resumption of commercial whaling will increase consumption in Japan anyway. Mark in Bristol, coming back to you on that point of scientific research, what is the research that can only be carried out on a dead whale as opposed to the research that could be carried out on a living whale? Well, we, we've now moved beyond a point, uh, Peter, where Japan is actually arguing in favour of its research uh, whaling. So this is, in effect, uh, forgive the pun, a dead issue. But what they did argue was that there are things that they could only do with dead whales, like examine their stomach contents, and there are growth rings within a waxy earplug, uh, which would help to uh, determine their age. So they made arguments that they needed to have that kind of information for some reason or other. But m many of us regard the last almost sort of 30 years of research whaling as simply a cover for commercial whaling. And now what's happening is that they are going overtly a commercial whaling. So the science arguments, of course, if you kill animals, you can measure things. So you can get papers and you can publish things. And I'm sure that Ken would, would agree with that. But on that issue of the big predators that he touched on, in the 20th century, millions of whales were removed by uh, industrial uh, whaling. And what is most worrying about Japan's move in, in many ways, in, in an international sense, is if they go ahead and do this, will other countries follow? And will we then move back towards some unregulated uh, maelstrom uh, of whaling? Michael, put that in historical context for us, because Mark is touching on a generally historically accepted fact, isn't he? After World War II, there was a need to have lots of high-protein food because people were starving, and Japan had been at the sharp end of that particular conflict. Uh, sure. I mean, there, historically speaking, uh, whaling did have uh, uh, both a cultural and economic uh, impact on, on the development of, of a lot of maritime societies. Uh, I do think uh, that, uh, as your other guests have been saying, I don't think there's really much disagreement among any of us that, um, that in fact, you know, today essentially it's it's not uh, it, it's not something that's vital. And uh, from an economic point of view, it, it's clearly uh, in Japan, and I think probably in the last remaining whaling countries, a dying industry. Uh, but uh, for nationalistic and political reasons. Uh, it carries on in Japan for at least a while longer. But it's probably on its last legs even here. But staying with that idea of that was then, this is now for a second, Michael, the reality is, according to the latest figures that I've been able to find from the Japanese Fisheries Agency, the, your average person in Japan consumes 40 grams of whale meat per year. I mean, you know, as, mm. as an exercise in profit and loss, this is, this is a loss-leading industry. Yes, and that's uh, one of the interesting points about this. Uh, Japan is moving back into commercial whaling at a time in which, you know, I mean, commercial means profit, it means business. But it's it's a very uh, bad uh, uh, business to move into because uh, uh, the Japanese people are not eating a lot of whale meat anymore. And uh, to the extent that they are, it's often uh, driven by politics in, in the local regions. Uh, not necess not by the dietary habits of most Japanese. Now, there are some bars where whale meat still might be served to some customers, but it's not uh, it, it's not something that's uh, 
you know, you find in every store or around Japan or, or is eaten by every every person. King Collins in Southampton, this particular part of the fishing industry globally in the last 12 months has lost 15 million dollars. That's how much it's gone into the red, if you will, in, it, in its whaling bank account. On top of that, the government out of Tokyo yes, subsidises it. My point is this. Is there a, another part of the fishing industry any place in the world that is either losing money at that rate or is subsidised at the same time by the relevant government? Well, I mean, I'd like to just bring up the, uh, the Iceland ex experience because Iceland is a, a small uh, whaling nation and it's actually driven by the curiosity of tourists. So half the whale caught in Iceland uh, is actually eaten by tourists who are eating, you know, uh, tour tourists who are curious, what does whale meat taste like? I mean, and, you know, there is the demand, uh, you know, it's not for its necessity, simply um, out of curiosity. And, you know, it's... And the anti-whaling lobby in Iceland say, meat, you know, greet me, don't eat me, you know, to, to visiting tourists, you know. Um, Whales are worth a huge amount more in uh, as uh, through you know, na nature tourism. You know, people people absolutely fascinated by whales, and you know to to actually see them. Similarly with sharks, people are fascinated by the big sharks. You know, just killing them is is a ridiculous waste of a natural resource. Michael Penn in Tokyo, is that a valid argument in your opinion and does that argument get any traction any place in Japan? I mean, the industry, the ecotourism industry that Ken Collins is talking about globally is worth $77 billion every 12 months. So if it goes from being food tourism, you know, rather than eat something that tastes like very greasy chicken when it's cooked properly, go and see the whales in their natural habitat and they can then swim off and do what whales do. Right. Well, fortunately, uh, that kind of uh, uh, ecotourism, whale-eating link has never really developed in the case of Japan. Uh, to the extent that foreigners are involved in the whaling issue in Japan at all, it's as uh, activists uh, uh, against whaling. And in fact, you know, uh, the, the towns where they, where the whalers are, uh, to some extent, you know, bar anybody, uh, have very strong security services uh, looking for foreigners who are who are there to, as they would see, cause, say, cause trouble about uh, the whaling or fishing industries. Uh, so uh, the people who are eating whale meat in Japan, uh, generally speaking, are, are all Japanese. Uh, and I have heard, for example, that uh, you know the politicians have wanted like school children also to have it as part of their, you know, lunches and things like this in order to uh, keep a next generation that continues to eat whale meat. So, but this is all basically. Uh, based on a political lobby, uh, not on a tourism industry uh, that, that feeds on whale meat. Mark, in Bristol, when you talk to people who are involved in this industry or they're involved in the, the anti-whaling lobby, if you will, do you get the sense that they might say, well, actually, the whaling countries, they're kind of undermining their own image on the global stage here? Oh, uh, absolutely. I mean, it's quite interesting that... Um that the whale watching industry in Iceland is is now uh, very big and very successful, uh, and that the people of Iceland, I think, have started to change their their positioning. That there there is not going to be any whaling this summer, this this whaling season in Iceland, which is actually quite big news that just came in a couple of days ago and was kind of sort of pushed out of the media because of the big news coming in from Japan, which of course is moving in entirely the opposite direction. There is a small amount of whale watching. Uh, activity in Japan, and there is, I think, growing interest from the Japanese people. But as Michael has said uh, very clearly, what's happening is that the, it, this is about the government of Japan and what the Prime Minister and his key advisers and supporters want to do, and they are essentially moving to a new strategic position uh, with whaling, which is coming out of the, of the International Whaling Commission, which is the internationally recognised body for the management of whaling and the conservation of whales. And in doing that, they are just setting this very, very bad example to the rest of the world because, of course, it's a time... We talk about fisheries resources or we can talk about any other uh, living and natural resources. It's a time when we need countries to be cooperating and working with each other. And so what Japan is doing is just rushing off in absolutely the wrong direction. 
Michael Penn in Tokyo, try and unpack something for us, Michael. It seems to me here that what we're talking about is this mix of national politics and national pride, and it would be a very tough... And local perhaps, politics. And local politics as well, right. So it would be a very tough prime minister who took on the whaling lobby because of that kind of iconic place that they represent within Japan. Or maybe I've got that completely wrong. Well, I think you see it in politics in almost every country where you have uh, a lobby, even a relatively small one, on one side of an issue, but you don't have a very well-organized lobby on the other side of the issue, which means that that group, even if they're not terribly big or, or well-financed, can, can run the national policy because they're not meeting organized resistance. And I think that's pretty much the way that, that the whaling setup is here. You have these local governments and local politicians, some of them are, are very key in, in the ruling party, and they're pushing for their local industries to continue their whaling. And on the other side, uh, comparative to international opinion, the anti-whaling movement in Japan is very small. Uh, it's a handful of people, essentially, when there are protests. Uh, so, And it's certainly not uh, politically uh, um, mobilized. So uh, from that point of view, it's, it's simply that if you're doing politics, you're a politician. On one side, you can gain some supporters. And on the other side, you're not going to lose any because there isn't much force there. Ken, is this, in one sense, Could good I? news for the whales, in as much as we seem to be talking about a fading slash dying industry that politicians at the highest level don't really want to get involved with, but because the industry is expensive and requires l big government subsidies sooner or later, sooner rather than later, the industry will cease to exist anyway? One hopes so. Uh, one other factor to put in the equation, how incredibly cruel and painful and slow the death is for the whales, because you're sort of fairly randomly shooting a grenade into the into the back of a whale and exploding it, and then eventually it dies. And there is no quick, humane way of killing a whale. So on animal cruelty uh, basis, you know, even if you really do like whale meat, there is no humane way of slaughtering whales. Mark in Bristol, is there another dynamic here that maybe spells the end of the industry around the world, and including in that assessment Norway and Iceland too, I guess? In Japan, you've got an ageing population, a falling birth rate, you've got a younger generation who want to try other stuff, and as we said in our introduction, their tastes, their palates have moved on. Yeah, I think the, I think the younger generation in Japan are much more like the younger people in the Western uh, world. They want the same kind of things. They're interested in the same kind of things. But I think this is very much in the hands of the leaders within Japan, those people, as Michael has said, who are supported by their political constituencies, where this is an important political issue uh, for them. But I don't think there's any way that they uh, are preparing for the industry to die. The industry has been subsidised in various ways linked to the, re the so-called research whaling for decades. And I'm quite sure that the Prime Minister and his friends, his allies, are going into a new position now where they intend to make this work. They intend to make this, in this industry uh, continue. And as you've, as we've illustrated, I think, very well from this discussion, at the root of it is a commodity, whale meat, which is not of any importance. That average weight of 40 or 50 grams per individual person in Japan is like half an apple a year. You know, this just hasn't got any economic or, or, or nutritional uh, significance to the general population. There will be a few communities where it's more commonly at, but beyond that, really, this is just something which creates so much problem uh, for Japan all around the world, and it's done a very strange thing with this latest move. Michael, you were nodding there listening to Mark Simmons out of Bristol, staying with you in Tokyo. Is there uh, a silent minority of people who, if it came down to putting a cross in a box, I guess, would support the whaling industry because they're anti anti-whaling industry people because they feel they're being got at, because they feel perhaps, no, somebody outside Japan should not tell us what to do? Well, if I was to characterize the, the majority Japanese position on the issue of whaling, it would be uh, indifference. Uh, it simply does not part of their daily lives, and, and it's not something that they, they see a lot on the media here. Uh, it, it's just not a concern. But there are two points, I think, are worth bearing in mind about this change. One is that uh, 
the compared to the commercial whaling that had been done uh, until recently, uh, now we're going actually the amount of catches of whales, the amount of whales being killed by Japan under this new commercial whaling program uh, is actually far less than they had been doing under the so-called uh, scientific whaling uh, until recently and within the uh, within the IWC. And another point is is that uh, in a sense the mask is off now. You know, Japan had been uh, pretending for decades that it was about science, it was about something else. Now, in a sense, they're, they're, they've been outed, and, and we now know that it's about business, money, politics. So in that sense, it's also something that damages their position. Ken in Southampton, what are the chances that a Japanese prime minister does quotes, and I use the phrase advisedly, does the right thing and lets loose market forces on the whaling industry? Because surely, if you let loose market forces, the industry ceases to exist. Of course, yes. I mean, there have been all sorts of subsidies for decades. And, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's... But we see see this around around the world. I mean, uh, the, the climate issue is... Uh, and the USA's with, withdrawal from the Paris Agreement, not wanting to control its carbon dioxide, similar sort of thing, driven, driven by lobbyists rather than science. Not wishing to put words into your mouth, Mark Simmons in Bristol, how much longer will this industry carry on being, I guess, a touchstone of national identity? I, I'm not sure it is a touchstone of, of national identity. I think it's important to some people, it's important to some communities. Uh, and when the fleets were launched just in the last day or so, we saw a lot of activity and interest in Japan. And, of course, that's part of the campaign in favour of it. And it's worth remembering that Japan has put millions of dollars, millions of pounds, millions of yen into its campaigns over the years to maintain this, this industry. And I don't think that uh, the Prime Minister is going to move away uh, from that position. So I don't think we can put a, a, a sort of timeline uh, on this at all. And I'm also quite sure that Japan is watching to see how the West, rest of the world is responding to what it's doing. And that's going to be very important. And I think a strong response is required. So certainly organisations like my own have been calling for high-level diplomatic response so that Japan understands that going whaling outside of the appropriate uh, international body which was set up to... Uh, to, to manage it, and which at this time is still maintaining its moratorium is absolutely, that's the wrong thing to do. And on the numbers issue that Michael brought up, if I, if I may, Peter, um, Michael said that the numbers have, have come down. So it's been quite difficult over the last couple of days to actually work out what the quotas look like. The initial quota figures, it seems, didn't cover the catch for the whole of a year. And so we're now looking at a catch in the North Pacific of something like 300 and 83 whales uh, altogether, which is certainly more than was being caught in the North Pacific under research whaling. But where I can, I can agree with Michael is that the other research whaling programme, which was in the Southern Ocean, which has been closed down, that was catching 333 minke whales. So we've lost that. But these are very early days, and we're watching these quotas and trying to understand how they're being calculated uh, very carefully. An intriguing point to end our discussion today here on Inside Story. Ken, Michael, Mark, thank you all. Thank you to our guests. They were Ken Collins, Michael Penn and Mark Simmons. And thank you to you too for watching the programme. You can see the show anytime again on the website, aljazeera.com. And for more discussion, go to Facebook. That's our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also keep the conversation going on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. Or you can tweet me. I'll tweet you back. I'm at Peter Dobby one from me, Peter Dobby, and everyone here on the Inside Story team in Doha. Thanks for watching. We will see you very soon. Bye-bye.